morning, church. I'm going to be uh, start reading in, in Luke chapter 2 if you want to go ahead over there. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everybody went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and she placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You know, on the night that Jesus was born, there is a, a stark <laughs> contrast between what is happening in the physical world and what is happening in the spiritual realm. Now, in the physical world, for most of humanity, this night is, is no different than, than any other night. It says shepherds are watching their flocks, and governments are conducting their business. People are traveling. All is calm. All is bright. There is, however, a disturbance in the force, because behind the veil, in the spiritual realm, a supernatural event is taking place that is so seismic, so profound that the Praise happening in heavenly realms is literally spilling over into the realm of man. As hosts of angels appear to lowly shepherds, ironically, only a few believers, several mad die and, and a frightened king, are truly aware enough to make any kind of real preparation for the birth of something that is somehow Son of God and the Word of God made flesh through whom all things were made. Heaven and nature are singing, heralding the coming of the Lord. In the spiritual realm, there has been thousands of years for preparation for this moment, and yet, on earth, among man, upon his arrival, there wasn't even room available for the long-awaited Messiah. There was no room for a king. That's the title of our sermon today. No room for a king. And we're going to learn a little bit about what this king with no room did for every single one of us here. Amen? Before I do, let's go to God in the word of prayer. God in heaven, God, we pray right now that you would speak to our hearts as we look at the story of the birth of Jesus. God, we pray right now that you would speak. God, that you would, you would move us. God, that the Holy Spirit would move us to a place closer to you. God, allow the story of Jesus to move us to a place where we are ready to make Jesus Lord. God, where we are ready to make decisions to draw closer to you. God, I pray that if there is any heart wrestling with that decision right now in this room, God, I pray, God, that you would speak powerfully to that heart. Speak powerfully to all of our hearts. And 
As we look at your word, God, I pray that this time pleases you. God, thank you so much for the story of Christmas. God, thank you so much for this time of year. God, thank you so much for Jesus. And we pray this all in his name. Amen. <coughs> so, because there is no room available for a king, Jesus has to be born in a, a barn or, or a cave. Or, they're honestly not exactly sure historically what the structure is, right? We have decided that it's a little house, right, um, with, with animals in it that we put in our front yards, right? That, that's, that is what we have decided, but honestly it may have been a cave. What we do know is that it was a place where animals were kept. Now, we don't know the name of the people who owned this barn or, or cave, right? But it is safe to say that the owners probably were not prepared for this visit. And, and I'm certain that they didn't know that the young woman with Joseph was carrying inside of her the Son of God. I'm willing to bet that had they known, Jesus would not have been born in a cave or a barn or whatever it is. I think had they known who that baby was, they would have figured out some way to make every single accommodation possible. Because that's what we do, right? Right or wrong, when important visitors arrive, we prepare to be hospitable. And, and I don't know about you, but I love it when somebody takes time to prepare to be hospitable to me. Right? Do you, do you enjoy that? You know, um, just recently we took our boys on a vacation, and uh, we took them on a cruise, right? Cruises are like the thing, y'all. Like, everybody's got to do it. I love cruises. It's the best. It's my new vacation of choice. All right? And one of the things about it, you get to do all kind of fun stuff, and you get to go on the island, but the thing that me and my sons got hooked on on the cruise was room service. <laughs> Yo, like, we really, I would pick up the boys. They had this little kid area, right? So I picked them up, and on the way back at, like, 11 at night, they'd be like, Dad, can we get room service? And I'm like, yes, let's do it. Because I paid for this cruise. I want to do everything. I'm getting my money's worth. Right? So we're, we're, we're ordering room service. And what's, what I love about it is you can order like anything. Right? There's like this whole menu. But if you change it, if you say, I want something different, they'll do it. Right? I'm like, can I have spaghetti? But can I have the meatballs on the side? It's a thing. They'll do that. Right? You can ask for whatever you want. And they are prepared to be hospitable to you. The person who loved it the most out of our whole family was our youngest, Adrian. Adrian got hit to this really quick. He realized that whatever he asked for on a cruise, he got. And so every time we went to eat, he would he would order, he he did his he, I'd, I'd have the Caesar salad, my good man. He really loved ordering at the restaurants. And then he would ask for things that weren't on the menu. He'd be like, and do you guys have orange jello? And he really, they always had it. Adrian just loved ordering. I think they knew it was him at some point. This kid was Jello, and they would get Adrian his Jello. We were enjoying being being prepared for, enjoying the hospitality of the cruise. We love this type of hospitality. Jesus, the King of all kings, was coming to the world, and yet we know that his first bed was a manger, a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. It is a feeding trough for an animal. It, we've made it look very pretty. We have, I think it's fair to say, we've romanticized the manger a bit. Right? We've made it look kind of like a crib, but it is a feeding trough. It's kind of like our church baptistry. Right? I don't know if y'all know that, but it's not a baptistry. It's like, it's like a water trough thing for horses, correct? We make it look good and we put a curtain around it, but it's still a trough. <laughs> Jesus' first bed is, is, is a feeding trough for animals. Because there was no room prepared for Jesus. He was born into a world where no room was made for the other. Where any act of hospitality stood out because the world that Jesus was born into, our world, had long since embraced the myth of scarcity. 
The belief that there is not enough room or food or goods for everybody. We talked about this a few weeks ago. That there is literally a myth of scarcity that we believe. God is a generous God. God has the cattle on a thousand hills, but we listen to the evil one and we believe there's not enough. We need to hoard it. We need to keep it for ourselves. And this is the world that Jesus arrived in. And therefore, the world that Jesus lived in, injustice and oppression would be a way of life. His young eyes would have seen atrocities committed in the name of self-preservation. In fact, he would grow up knowing that his very birth was linked to the deaths of literally hundreds of oppressed people. If you want to look over in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, after Jesus is born, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take your child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled, the Lord, uh, so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity that were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You realize the first thing that Jesus, our Savior, had to do when he was born is literally run for his life. He had to escape to Egypt because there was a king named Herod who would embrace the myth of scarcity. For Herod, there wasn't enough. There's not enough room in this town for the both of us. There cannot be two kings. There's not enough power to go around. And so Herod, fully embracing that myth, committed an atrocity that left the blood of hundreds of children on his hands. This is the world that Jesus was born into. And this idea of there not being enough room would be a constant throughout the ministry of Jesus. There's not enough room for you here, Jesus. The religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, did not want to make room for Jesus. They didn't want to make room for this, this new religious leader that the people were flocking to. The political leaders of the day, Rome, King Herod, they didn't want to make room for Jesus. However, ironically, there was always room for him amongst the poor and amongst the sinners and the sick. You know, the fact is that most of Jesus' relationships can actually be put in these two categories. Those who made room and those who would not make room. These are the two categories that almost every relationship he had can be put into. Matthew 25, verse 31, tells a parable about them. The parable of the sheep and the goats. It says in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and, clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? 
When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. You who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You know, I used to look at this scripture and I used to kind of see it as uh, sheep good, goats bad. Right? That's, that was my elementary understanding of it. And when I read the scripture, I really thought about the fact that I, I, I saw it as, rather, that Jesus is going to take all the righteous and they will be on the right and all the unrighteous on the left. Right? To judgment as a whole. However, what I fail to look at is why the king praised the sheep and why he cursed the goats. It's actually very specific. It was all about hospitality or the lack thereof. He literally separates everybody in two groups based upon hospitality or their, their lack of hospitality. It's not just about everything you've done. Right now, we are talking specifically about do you make room for others? See, the sheep make room. The goats believe that there is no room. They do not make room. He said, you either did or didn't make room for me. I was in need, and you either did or didn't show me hospitality. The practical question that one must ask for this parable is obvious. Have you made room for Jesus? Now, in today's religious context, we often answer that question kind of in terms of our heart. Right? If I say, have you made room for Jesus in your life? You'll say, of course, I'm a Christian. Right? There's always room for Jesus in my life. There's always room for Jesus. Like Jello. Right? That's the way we tend to answer it, but that's not how the king defines you making room. See, he makes it very, very practical. The king answers in a way that is more practical, and I'll be honest, a lot more challenging to me personally. He says, did you show hospitality to the least of these brothers and sisters? And, you know, we want to answer it. We want to say, I, I love you, Lord. You know I love you. Right? You saw me in worship. My hands were up. Right? My eyes were closed. I was crying. I was singing reckless love. You know I love you. But what did Jesus say to Peter when Peter said, God, you know I love you? He said, feed my sheep. Amen? Amen. Feed my sheep. <laughs> See, Jesus asked us to, to make room for his sheep. Make room for the people that he cares about. Feed my sheep. Be hospitable. I'm challenged by this story, not just because he says be hospitable. I'm challenged because the king breaks down what it means to be hospitable. Right? He says, I needed food or drink. Right? He's talking about possessions. He's talking about literally what we have, our money. Do you, do you give the things you have to the people who need them? Very practical, right? He says... I was a stranger and you invited me in. Very specifically, he says, do you invite those in who have nowhere to be? We've been talking a lot about this as a church. The king gets very specific about what it means. He says, you took time and you visited me when I was sick and I was in prison. You took your time. See, he talks about our resources he talks about our homes, he talks about breaking bread, and he talks about our time. And see, now I'm very convicted because 
I struggle. I'm going to be honest with you guys really quick. I struggle to give my time. I, I don't know whatever, everybody might have a, a different thing, but I struggle to give my time. Time is my most valuable commodity, right? Time is precious. And the truth is, here's the truth, I struggle to manage my time. Right? It's precious to me. I struggle to manage it. I, I might actually be something that people call time blind. I am not aware of the time very well. But I also like to try to accomplish a lot with my time, which is not a great recipe for success. I love my time. I need my time. I don't manage my time very well. Here's a little side note. It is my observation that the area that we struggle the most with managing in life is also where we struggle with generosity and hospitality. If you struggle to manage your finances, we well, you often feel like you aren't able to be financially generous. If you struggle to manage your household, well, we don't usually want to invite people into our home. If you're like me and you struggle to manage your schedule, then it's very hard for you to make time for other people. Which is why as a church, as we've been trying to grow in our financial giving, Will has been trying to connect us with resources, with books and people to help us manage our finances. Because we know if we're going to be generous in any area, it's important that we know how to manage it. But I struggle to manage my time, and so that is the area that I am convicted about. Now, the king is interesting in the story. He took it very personally that people didn't show hospitality to other people. For Jesus, from this story, one thing that we need to understand is that hospitality to him is very personal. Hospitality is personal to Jesus. It's as personal as the story of his own birth. Because remember, he was a king for which there was no room. And that makes what Jesus says in John chapter 14 so powerful. He says in John chapter 14, verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would not have told you that I was going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back for you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I was going. See, to me, this is an amazing thing. The king for whom there was no room went to heaven to prepare for us many rooms. Jesus literally came to earth to make room for each and every one of you. And, and not simply in heaven. Yes, he says, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm, he's up there right now preparing a room for you in his father's house. I don't know what that looks like. Right? In Kingdom Kids, we would always say, what do you, what's going to be in your room? And we'd name a bunch of stuff. Right? I'm going to have an Xbox in my room. And I'm going to have a, you know, a pinball machine in my room. I don't know how it works. I'm just glad I have one, amen? Jesus is preparing a room for you in heaven, but that's not the only place that Jesus came to make room for you. You see, Jesus, in life, in every way, was constantly opening up his arms, opening up his heart, and saying, you are welcome here. I want you here. You're allowed to be here. To me, that's a very encouraging thing. That I am allowed to be here. Did you know you're allowed to be here? Amen. You know, for me in life, I struggle with something called imposter syndrome. Can anybody relate? Amen. Imposter syndrome, for you guys who are super confident and don't have it, means that you don't feel allowed to be anywhere you are. Right? So I would be in school. I would be like a, like a junior. I was like on my third year of grad school, still expecting them to be like, oops, you're not supposed to be here. We looked at your records before, you're, you're not really, you have to go home. Right? And so, the fact that Jesus says, listen, Marcus, you are allowed to be here. He says, church, you're allowed to be here. That's what Jesus wants us to feel. And you see him doing this throughout his entire ministry. To the little children. We know the story. 
They were trying to send the little children away from Jesus. And Jesus says, no, let them come to me. They are allowed to be here. To the leper who comes to be healed. Everybody's running away. Jesus says, no, no, no. Come here. I will touch you. Right? You're allowed to be here. You don't need to leave. To Mary Magdalene, he says, you are allowed to sit at my feet and learn along with my disciples, a place that many felt a woman could not be. He says, you're allowed to be here. You can stay. Don't make anybody feel like you cannot be here. To the sinner and the tax collector, he says, you're welcome to share a meal with me. You're not too unclean to eat with me. We can break bread together. To the outcast and the unwanted, to the oppressed, he says, there is room for you in the kingdom of God. Church, there is room for all people here. That is why we strive to be a church for all people. It's in our mission statement because that's who Jesus was. It's not about who we are. It's not about our goodness. It's about the fact that Jesus was saying for over the course of his entire ministry to all people, no matter where you're from or what you're coming from, you're allowed to be here. We can all, every single one of us, can have the opportunity to believe, repent, and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That, that promise is for all people, for all that will come. That is the gift of Jesus. That is why he came, to make room for us. You know, the hospitality of Christ isn't a means to an end. It's not about being nice so that people would follow him. In the same way, as a church, our hospitality is not a means to an end. It can't be. It cannot be transactional. Our hospitality isn't about being nice and, and saying good things and doing things for the community so that people will come and be a part of the church. It is about being like the man we follow. Amen. It's about being like Jesus. Several weeks ago, we talked about the fact that generosity is actually just who God is. That God is, in fact, generosity. He can't help it. When he gives, it overflows. That's what it says about God. Jesus is hospitality. Jesus is making room for other people and showing love. If we are called Christians, if we are disciples of that man, then we need to become hospitality as a church. Amen. It's about his desire to be with us and his desire to make room for all people. And he left that charge to his church. Jesus was a king with no room. And he made room for every single one of us. You know, this pattern is something that you see that is just so Jesus. That what he should have received, right, we ended up getting. And what we should have received, he took on. Jesus was, was literally the word through whom everything was made. When Jesus showed up on the planet, there should have been every single human voice, all that has breath, should have been singing the praises of the birth of this baby. But he isn't even given a place to lay down. See, Jesus wasn't given a room, but he is making an incredible room for you in the kingdom of heaven. In the same way, as Jesus grew as a man, he committed no sin. He committed absolutely no sin. He lived a 100% righteous life, which means that he should have been able to, to experience the reward for that. Instead, what he decided to do was to take on the sin of everyone in this room. He died the death that we should die. In the same way that he had no room, but he gave us a room. He had no sin, but he's going to die the death that we should die. You know, we're going to transition this message into a communion. And we're going to 
take the juice that represents his blood and, 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 and break the bread that, that represents his body. But the thing that I want us to think about is how Jesus in every way switched places with us. He was a king. He should have received all praise, all glory. And his birth was in the most humble of circumstances. He was a righteous man with no sin. And yet, he died for us so that we could have a chance to be with him. He died for us so that he could continue to show us hospitality. See, here's the thing about our sin that we always have to remember. God's goal is to be with you. Jesus' goal is to be with you. However, at some point, everybody in this room decided to make themselves one with sin. And the problem with that is that God cannot be in the presence of sin. So for Jesus to be with us, for Jesus to show us hospitality and take care of us and have us in that room that he has prepared for us, Jesus had to die for us. Jesus had to, his blood had to atone for our sin. And so as we take communion, and as we remember the birth of Jesus at this time, let's take time to remember the ways that Jesus traded places with us so that he can continue to show us his hospitality. Amen? Let's pray. God in heaven, we are humbled that we are able to take communion at this time. God, thank you for the, the, the juice that represents your blood. Uh, the bread that represents your body, God, thank you that you were willing to send your son, your one son, to die in the place of everyone here. God, I pray so much, God, that as we take this communion, God, but as we remember Jesus, not only in this time, but in this time of year, God, that we are so thankful for what he afforded us here. God, thank you that he was willing God, to take our punishment. Thank you that he was willing to live in such a humble way, to be born in such a humble way. God, thank you for this time that we get to remember Jesus. God, we pray that we take it in a worthy manner. God, thank you so much for communion. God, thank you so much for this time, this church, God, and the life that Jesus gives every single one of us. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.